The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. In 1973, the New York City Police Department created a hostage negotiation team. It's not up against the gun. It's up against the man's mind. When you're defusing a human bomb, it's the same as when you're taking apart a real bomb. If you skip a step, it's going to blow up right in your face. Talk to Me tells the high stakes true story of the world's first hostage negotiation team. It changed policing forever. Talk to Me. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, a young boy goes to a science fair at school but never comes home. What happened to Kyron Horman? and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my PD co-host, Alice. Hi, Brett. I have no idea what PD means. Like, like Pete that you burn from Scotland? That's a good guess, actually, <laughs> because it is a word from Scotland. Uh, Inga, who lives on the Orkney Islands, has to be one of our few few listeners on the Orkney Islands. Since I think there's only like 10 people on the Orkney Islands. So maybe everybody on the Orkney Islands. Maybe listen. they all listen. Maybe, Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, maybe that's like the highest per capita listening place in the world. Ooh, but in that any would event, be great. She suggested it. It means like petite. Oh, Petey. I kind of like yeah. that. Petey. I mean, that's I thought cute. you were just yeah. talking about your love of whiskey or something, you know, like something mm. that's Petey. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> wow, that's a good... <laughs> That's a good one, Alice. Look you at know, me you, you and etymology me every day. <laughs> I like words. What can I say? You do like words. It's your thing. I don't. No, I, it's not my thing. In fact, it's just puns that I really like. But thank you, Inga. That's an awesome, awesome word. I love it. I always love learning new words, and I always get a little nervous because yeah. people give you really good words that I've never heard of. Mm, it's true. It's true. I like the ones. I like the ones from other countries because I feel like I'm learning something. You there know? you go. There you go. We're bringing the world together here on the show. I like it. So shout out to everybody on the Orkney Islands who is listening to the show. We love you guys. One day we'll have to come over. Oh, and I have would some. Love that. Have some scotch. I on have. The Orkney Islands. I have not been to Scotland before, so I would love that. Actually, it looks beautiful. I love Scotland. Scotland's amazing. It really is. It's an incredible place. I know. Place. We've heard about your awesome kilt story, and I want to oh, I want to see you point. in this yeah. kilt. <laughs> anytime. Hey, Alice, I will go to Scotland with you anytime. We should do a reason. live recording there just to go get you some kilts. There you kilts. go. There you go. If anyone's listening in Scotland, this, this should be a reason for an inspiration. Send there us an invitation. <laughs> we'll see you in Edinburgh. <laughs> well, Brett, we are recording this on the cusp of Thanksgiving, but when this comes out, we'll be like in the throes of the holiday season, and I'm so excited. So I I usually am not like a rush to get your Christmas decorations out after Halloween person, but it's keeping my boys like – in check because if they're acting well if they're disciplined i'm like we'll get to take out the train today and so today we took out the christmas village and they just like their minds were blown they're like the village it's so little but it's not real so <laughs> i am it's been really fun to like slowly bring out the holiday decorations as a tool for discipline well you know my daughter this this was the first year where she really enjoyed Halloween, and I think she's obviously really going to enjoy Christmas. So I'm looking forward to it. I think I'm actually going to go get my Christmas tree tomorrow. Ooh, so where, where do you am, go? Is it, Do you go to like the big box stores, or do you go to a farm? So I've gone to a farm before and found that to be like 
it's, far more difficult than I expected it to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just I just went back. It, it'll be, you know, Home Depot for me. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's streets, no shame good. in that. You know, the best place, when I lived in D.C., I lived in Logan Circle, which, you know, I didn't have a car or anything. And so getting a Christmas tree, you had to just carry it. But the Whole Foods right there in Logan Circle always had like a little Christmas tree farm right outside on the sidewalk. And they made a killing because no one had cars. All of us, you know, just had to carry our trees over to our apartments and up probably three flights of stairs. So I had like a Whole Foods Christmas tree for many years when I lived in D.C. There you go. Look, Home Depot's got, they got good trees. If you're looking for trees, go to Home Depot. <laughs> That's but right. yeah, we've done the farm thing before. I think we're just going to stick with Home Depot. We, we go to the event, farm to take pictures. Exactly. You go to the farm to take pictures and drink hot chocolate and, and that sort of thing. And and I've already watched several Hallmark Christmas movies. If you're on the gallery, I put my bingo card up there. <laughs> I like so. how people are trying to guess, but I was like, I've already bingoed this so hard, guys. I don't need to share my <laughs> bingo card. I've already won this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So join us join us for some holiday bingo. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot okay. of fun. Okay. Okay, let's get to Kyron because this let's is such an interesting case. Whenever someone disappears into thin air, Brett, I just it totally boggles my mind because it's it's really hard, guys, to disappear into thin air, either on purpose or by accident or to make someone else disappear. It's it, even though we hear about it and we talk about a lot of these cases, it is just not an easy feat. And this is one of the most into thin air disappearances I've ever seen. I mean, we're going to talk about this case for a couple, three episodes or so. I'm not sure exactly how long it'll take, but there is just not a lot of evidence in this case. This is a case that comes highly recommended. Everybody wants us to do this case. We've been sort of circling around it for a while. You know, it's, it's one that a lot of people have covered, but there's just not a ton of information out there because once again, there's just not a lot of information. But if you are interested in this case there's a couple things you can do you can check out little boy lost which is on investigation discovery it's kind of a nice primer for it oregon live which is a website that covers oregon has a lot of articles on this case good place to start if you want to read a book on this there's a book called boy missing the search for kyron horman which is good i recommend that as well but we're gonna do our best and we're gonna try and tease out some things that happened in this case but this is this one's a mystery. This is a tough one. This is one where there's a reason it fascinates people in true crime. And you're going to see that. If you're not familiar with this story, this is a story that's that's going to send you down some rabbit holes. But unfortunately, there's just not that many holes to go down. Because as I said, we have sort of a focus in this case that we're going to talk about. It's going to become pretty obvious pretty quickly who people think is involved in this. But a lot of it is speculative because there's just not a lot of hard evidence. But for those of you who don't know this story, let me give you the background. So Kyron Horman was a normal seven year old little boy. He loved tree frogs and spending time with his mom, Desiree. He was scared of storms and the dark. Now he lived with his dad, Kane, and his stepmother, Terry Moulton. And there was no reason to think that anything bad could happen in his life. But soon, Kyron would become the center of a tremendous mystery, one of the most confounding and intractable of the 21st century, when he seemingly vanished into thin air from his own school. Where did Kyron go? Did someone take him? And was that someone a person he should have been able to trust above all others? So with that, let's dive into the timeline. On September 9th, 2002, Kyron Horman is born in Portland, Oregon. By the time of his birth, his parents, Kane Horman and Desiree Young, are in the process of getting a divorce. Kane had cheated on Desiree while she was pregnant with a woman named Terry Moulton. Kane stayed with Terry, the girlfriend, and would eventually marry her in 2007. But by the time Kyron was around, his parents were no longer together. And this is, this is a really important thing that happened. <laughs> you know, it's hard for something like that not to cast a very long shadow over the rest of your life. And it certainly did. And it's sort of going to dominate this entire story. It's an interesting group of people. Kane and Terry are really into working out. They're really into the gym. They met at the gym. 
Terry was actually a bodybuilder. So, you know, one of those people who they take the pictures with all the muscles and everything. She was, she was a bodybuilder. And so that was something they had in common. She was absolutely committed to the gym and apparently, you know, Desiree's pregnant and I guess maybe she couldn't go to the gym as much and, and it didn't take long for Kane to find the next person. So not an auspicious way to begin the story, but it is something that we're going to come back to again and again. Definitely. And also that Terry's been around basically, or at least has been in the picture since Kyron was born. Now, 2004, Desiree is diagnosed with kidney failure and has to travel to Canada for treatment. And Kyron is just really a toddler at this point. Now, up to this point, she did have primary custody of Kyron, but because of the kidney failure, she could no longer care for him while her treatment was ongoing. And so Kane and Terry became Kyron's chief caregivers. They refused to return him to Desiree's custody though, when she returns from Canada. Now, because Desiree had surrendered custody to the couple when she left, Oregon law allows them to take this action. So basically, Desiree had no choice but to, to give up custody when she went to go get treatment. But I think she expected to get Kyron back when, he, when she came back from getting her treatment. But that wasn't the case. And the law in the state allowed, allowed Kane and Terry to do that. Now, in the years that follow, Kane and Terry will have a daughter of their own. So Kyron's half-sister. Now we're going to jump ahead a little bit. So this is all, you know, this is, again, talking about the the auspicious, inauspicious start to his life. This is a lot going on when he's just about one and a half years old. He probably doesn't remember much of this, but this explains why he doesn't live with his mom. You know, every state's laws are different, but for the most part, child custody laws will favor custody with the mother for rightly or wrongly. That's what you will see in a lot of states. And so this, this begins to paint a picture of what's going on. And obviously there's a lot of distrust that's building up in this family. You can imagine, I mean, this is a mess. This is a mess. If you read Boy Missing, you really get an insight into how much dysfunction is going on with these adults and how much their children pay because of it. And it's not unusual. It's a story as old as time. It's one you'll hear a thousand times, but you know, it's hard to get into the story and really dig into it and not feel like, man, I wish people had just, I wish they just put the kids first a little bit more because there's so much game playing going on. And, and this is sort of the start of it where, yeah, you know, Desiree, she, she needed critical medical care. And I think her thought and her understanding when she went off to Canada to get this care was when she came back, she'd get her child back, but she didn't, you know, she shows back up and they're like, no. And so she tries to take him to court and the court says, sorry. And it makes sense. I mean, it makes sense in the abstract to have a law like this. It's basically, if you abandon your child to the custody of somebody else, don't come complaining to us and wanting them back. Sort of you made your bed. Now you got to lie in it. But this is a very unusual circumstance. And it kind of feels like that Desiree really, really got, you know, screwed over in this, frankly. And it sets, once again, everything that's happening in this distant past is setting the stage for what's going to come and for a lot of sort of the distrust that, that continues to this day. And I can't even imagine, by the way, to be facing kidney failure, not want to leave your child who you clearly care very much about. This was not a situation where she actually abandoned him. She just could not take him to go get treatment in Canada. And I think she fully, fully expected that she'd get him back. I can't, how do you even like have that conversation? Like, you know, someone comes to ring your doorbell and say, I'm here to pick up my child. And you're like, nope, not really. That's not going to happen. You know, we're, we're going through this quickly because we're trying to get to the the tragedy really in a few years, but this is huge and cannot be overstated. Now let's fast forward to June 3rd, 2010. Terry brings Chiron's science fair exhibit to Skyline Elementary where he attends school. The science fair is the next day. And the science fair is gonna play a huge role in this story. 
And it's also interesting that Terry does bring this the day before. This is a little fact that people kind of mix up sometimes. People will sometimes say that in, that she brought the exhibit the next day. And the reason that's important, there's going to be a lot of focus on Terry here as we go forward. Spoiler alert, going to be a lot of focus on her and what she did and when she did it. And there are people who say that Terry was this dedicated mother who was absolutely committed to Kyron and she might've been a stepmother, but he was a son to her. And then there's other people who say she was completely aloof, didn't care about him at all and didn't have anything to do with him. So there are some little facts about things she did the next day. And it's important just to know if you care to know that she took the exhibit the day before. We'll talk about in a second why that may be important, but nevertheless, June 3rd, 2010, she takes the exhibit next day. June 4th, the main day we're going to talk about, 8 a.m., Skyline Elementary opens, allowing parents and students to tour the science fair. So basically, any of you who've had kids or have been kids, I remember the science fair. And, you know, you set up everything in the gym and everybody walks around and acts like what you did was brilliant instead of probably not that brilliant at all. And somebody gets a blue ribbon and it's all great. And the parents walk around and it's wonderful, right? Well, that's essentially what this is. So they they take the stuff on June 3rd. I think they got graded on it on June 3rd. And then June 4th is the day when all the parents get to come and see it. So being the loving stepmother that she is, Terry is going to go and, and see this whole setup. There's also supposed to be a talent show that will be held later that day at one o'clock. So at 815... PTA president Gina Zimmerman sees Kyron with his stepmom Terry in front of his exhibit, which is a poster on red eyed tree frogs. Terry takes a picture and it is the last one ever taken of Kyron. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're seeing it right now. If you visit the website, you'll see it as well. If you know anything about this case, you have seen this picture a thousand times. So, it's not just PTA president Zimmerman who's going to see Kyron. His friends Carson, Tanner, Curtis, and Ellie also see him. And in fact, Terry takes a picture of Ellie. She has a project on turtles. Now, around 8.30 that morning, Kyron and Terry visit Scott Macbeth's classroom. That's Kyron's teacher in kindergarten and in first grade. Afterwards... Kyron goes up the stairwell nearest his classroom while Terry goes up the stairs on the other end of the hallway nearer to the gym. She will later say that the last thing she saw was Kyron walking to class and that class was math class. She says that she waved at him as he entered his classroom and at 8 45 Terry leaves the school. So note here, the story here is that they're not walking together. So she sees him go to the classroom, but they're actually using two different staircases. And you can kind of imagine this, and it's important to imagine this because it's become important. So basically, the school has these two sort of, it's divided in half. He's got this teacher that he had for a couple of years. They go by to visit him before school starts to say hello. And then essentially, he's going to go to class. She's going to leave. And there's these two stairways and they sort of both, they go up the stairways at the same time. She turns around, she sees him, she waves, he waves, and she watches him walk into his classroom. And the expectation is, you know, she's delivered him now. And everybody who has kids, if you ever drop them off at daycare or school or whatever, a lot of times you'll watch them until they get it, you know, they get on the bus or they get into school or they walk into their classroom. And then your thought is they are now safe. They are with another group of adults who are going to take care of them and I can go. And that's the story that Terry presents, that she did the thing that a good mother should do. She made sure that her child made it to class before she left. Right. And soon after that, 845, Terry leaves the school and another student does report seeing Kyron about 15 minutes after Terry leaves the school at 9 a.m. And the importance of that, as you can probably tell, is that if Terry left the school and the idea is that Kyron went with her, then someone couldn't have seen Kyron at the school. But that's not the case. Terry left and Kyron is reported as being seen in the school by somebody else. Now, obviously, that's a very controversial sighting. It's a student. It's a young student. 
after Kyron disappears, the police will interview every single student at Skyline Elementary, trying to establish a timeline for what happened to Kyron. And they have this one student, we don't know who it is. And you know, this is another thing. We're going to talk about a lot of things as if it's rock solid, absolutely happened. There's a lot of stuff that we believe we know based on things the police have told the family. Not a lot of public information on this case. The police have kept a lot of things close to the vest, as they often do. And this is another case of people criticize the police for that, including Desiree. But it seems like there was a student who says they thought they saw Kyra. Now, here's the thing. They say they saw him at 9 o'clock. How much do you trust that a child in elementary school, number one, is going to know for sure they saw him? Number two, is going to be accurate about the day they saw him. And number three, is going to be accurate about the time they saw him. So this is a controversial sighting. Obviously, if it's accurate, it's very significant. But it is impossible to know whether it's accurate or not. So we're up to nine o'clock. So at nine o'clock, Terry goes to a Fred Meyer store to pick up some children's Motrin for her daughter. Her daughter is with her. She rode, they took the truck, talk more about that in a minute, but they took the truck to drop Kyron off and do all this other stuff. The daughter is with her. She has an ear infection and obviously it's bothering her. So Terry is looking for some children's Motrin to treat this ear infection so her daughter will have a little bit of relief. Now the first store doesn't have it in stock. So she has to drive to another store, another Fred Meyer, to pick up the medicine. She arrives at the first store at around 9, 12 a.m., the second at 9, 40 a.m. She then stops at the dry cleaner and a craft store, Michael's, leaving there around 10, 10. Terry does buy the medicine. She also buys some groceries. Now, strangely, when police ask to see these items later on, no one's able to find them. The items are never really produced. And, you know, this is one of those things where you feel like the police should be able to figure out whether she bought this stuff or not. Feels like she probably did. Not sure why she can't produce them. I don't know. It's something people point to. It may be significant. Maybe it's not. Now, at this point, Terry does something that seems like it might be a little unusual. She says that she drives around for about 90 minutes, an hour and a half, hoping that the motion will help her daughter sleep. So she's got her daughter in the back seat. She's having an earache. She's obviously upset, probably. Terry's finally got some medicine. I assume she gives it to her. And now she's driving around for an hour and a half. And this is something some people do. You know, my kids always fall asleep in the back of the car. We don't really drive them around for any purpose because the last thing I want to do is get in the habit of having to drive my kids around anytime that they don't feel well. But this is something people do. Some people act like it's strange that she's driving her around for the earache. The point is to put the child to sleep. It's not going to cure the earache, but if you put the child to sleep, then they're going, they obviously won't be crying. They won't be in pain. And then you can do whatever you're going to do. Having said that, an hour and a half is a long time. <laughs> 90 minutes is a long time to drive the streets of Oregon trying to, to sort of rock your child to sleep. How old is her daughter at this point? Do we know? I'm just uh, curious, like someone who can speak or not. Okay, so she can't. She is old enough to speak because that actually becomes like a thing later on, I think. But I think she's really young. I think she's like two, maybe three or so. Okay. And, and, you know, that's a good point because I will say the driving around to get your child to sleep honestly is more of a baby thing because babies can be lulled to sleep more easily than a toddler. My kids, I could lull them to sleep in the car when they were still like in an infant carrier, so like a year or younger. But I can no longer really lull my children to sleep at age three, uh, at two, almost three and five. So that is a really long time, especially if she's already been driving at this point for about 70 minutes. And if those 70 minutes, her daughter has been really upset with an ear infection, like I'm not sure I would have it in me to drive for a, whole, a total of two and a half hours <laughs> because I'd be like, I need to get out of this car, like let her play somewhere, go outside, go walk around or something. So, it, you know, it is, it is a... An interesting fact. It's not totally out there. Every parent's done this before, but you know, the, the placement of it is an interesting fact. And it's going to get a little weirder even as we go on. And I believe her daughter was two and a half, three at the time. If someone wants to correct me on that, they can, but not a baby, but not, you know, not old enough to be going to school, for instance. She's still with her mother. So 
at 10 o'clock, classes begin at Skyline Elementary. So they've been having this, this, you know, whole fair thing all morning. So classes don't even start till 10. When they do, the teacher takes role in the math class, the one that Kyron was supposedly going to, and he is marked as absent. And in fact, he is not seen at the school that day. Now, what I find interesting about this, what we're told by Terry is that at around 8.45, she walks up the stairway, Kyron's walking up the stairway, she waves at Kyron, he goes to his math class. Why would he go to his math class at that point? The math class doesn't start until 10. So that's an hour and 15 minutes before the math class is going to start. I mean, I guess maybe he went to pick something up or drop something off and then went back to the gym, but it's certainly not the case that he's going to class and he's now going to be in class and you don't have to worry about him anymore. It's just, it's something that doesn't quite fit with the unusual schedule that day. It would make more sense, frankly, if she just said, I left him at the fair. He was at the fair, he was with the teachers, he was with the other students, and I left him. But this sort of notion that he would have gone to class that early doesn't really fit. So then a very strange thing happens. So remember, this it's around 10.10, 10 o'clock, 10.10, 10, 10, when Terry is, is driving around, supposedly, with her daughter. Well, at 10.30, someone will see Terry's truck parked on the side of Newberry Road which is not far from Skyline Elementary. At some point in our coverage of this case, we're going to go through these locations, where they are, and how far everything is away from each other. But just know that where Terry was when she was at the Fred Meyer, when she was at the, the dry cleaner, all that stuff, is not close to Newberry Road. Skyline Elementary is close to Newberry Road, but those things aren't. And Newberry Road, in fact, is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so she is seen parked on the side of the road. She will be confronted about this later and we'll have a story to tell, which we'll talk about, but this is when she's supposedly driving around trying to lull her daughter to sleep. An hour later at 1130, Dee Dee Spicer will leave her job. Her coworkers will say that she leaves her job. Now she is a friend of Terry's. And the way this will be described is she abruptly leaves her job at a lavender farm around 11.30 and is gone for about 90 minutes. And she will reappear 90 minutes later. And this was an unusual thing, and so it was something that stuck out in the minds of people who could not find her. And obviously, we're going to talk more about her later on. The Prosecutors is sponsored by BetterHelp. Guys, it's the holiday season, and you know how it can be. It's a time that should be joyous, but it's also a time that's stressful. And it's a time when depression and the problems in your life can really seem like they are on top of you. And that's why this is a good time to give yourself a gift to raise your spirits and not just for one day. Having someone to talk to about how you're feeling and what you can do about it is truly a gift. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. In. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists. 100% online, plus it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It could not be simpler. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash prosecutors. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash prosecutors. Hey, look, if you're spending time with loved ones for the holidays, chances are you're going to hear a lot of stories, the ones you love to hear and the ones you've heard a couple too many times. But have you ever wanted to help your loved one document these timeless stories? It can be challenging to write an entire book of life memories, but StoryWorth makes it fun and easy. This is how anyone can write a book about their life. Every week, StoryWorth will email your loved ones a single life-related question that you can pick from their collection, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? Or, what's the farthest you've ever traveled? Or, why'd you decide to get married? All they have to do is reply with a story. Then, after a year, StoryWorth completes your loved one's stories, memories, and even any photos into an exquisite hardcover book, creating a valued keepsake. 
for me, I'm actually doing story worth myself and answering the questions so that I can give that book to my kids one day. Hopefully they'll enjoy it. Millions of stories have already been told with story worth because they make the process so simple. Get started with your loved one for the holidays. And before you know it, you'll both be cherishing these timeless stories for generations to come. Help your family share their story this holiday season with StoryWorth. Go to StoryWorth.com slash TP today and save $10 on your first purchase. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash TP. StoryWorth.com slash TP to save $10 on your first purchase. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting. All while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states and situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Guys, we have told you about the Jordan Harbinger Show, and if you are still holding out, you need to check it out today. And I know, look, everybody's always telling you what podcast to listen to, but this is different. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker, so you can get a sense of how the world actually works. And look, if you're a fan of this podcast and you like true crime, Jordan has the shows for you. Check out the True Crime Starter Pack, and I promise you, you will be hooked. Jordan's always focused on pulling useful, practical insights out of his brilliant guest. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, you won't regret it. Now, at 11.39 a.m., Terry, we already talked about how she was a former bodybuilder, swings by the gym where she leaves her daughter at the on-site daycare. And although Terry will say she arrived at 11.39, the gym will actually clock her in at 12.20, so 40 minutes later than she says she arrives. Really quick on this, this is interesting if, in fact, her daughter is suffering from an earache to be dropped off at a daycare. If she's not contagious, you can certainly take them to a daycare. But just usually, I mean, we both have had kids who have had a lot of ear infections. They're usually very clingy. They want to be by you all the time. And I usually don't take them to, you know, extracurricular activities or daycares because they're usually just a little sad and whiny. So put that out there if this is part of the whole ear infection thing yeah, yeah. and i'm going to talk about this too because and i'm sure just save your emails sending us about <laughs> how you're an amazing parent and you do this all the time but i'll just go ahead and tell you when you have a toddler a three-year-old a four-year-old if you're going to take them somewhere your best bet is to pick one thing to do and do that when you start making multiple stops with the toddler you are asking for trouble and she is just all over the place with this this girl and she's not just a toddler as Alice said, she's a toddler with an earache. And here's the question I have. I am not as good a parent as Alice is. Alice is very <laughs> thoughtful and considerate. If it had been me, I would have gone straight to the gym to give her to the on-site daycare so that I didn't have to deal with it anymore, right? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. you give her to the on-site daycare and you're like, you guys take care of her. I'm going to go to the gym. You know, I gave her some Motrin. Like stop and get the Motrin, give it to her, then go to the gym on-site daycare is better than driving around for 90 minutes, right? They can maybe, you know, put her in a crib, get her to sleep, put her in a rocker, any number of things. And you can go spend 90 minutes at the gym, which you love to do. You know, if you're her, why are you driving around all this time when your plan has always been to go to the gym with the on-site daycare? Why do you do that? 
It really doesn't make any sense. And another thing on that, I know she wasn't able to produce any of the groceries she bought that morning. But the thing that is most confusing to me is not being able to find the Motrin. Because any of you who've gotten children's Motrin, it's usually liquid rather than pills. Because kids have difficulty swallowing pills. They choke. So it's usually a liquid bottle. And there's usually like a syringe-like looking thing or a cup to drink from. But either way, it's usually two parts for kids, and it's more than one dose. I don't even think you can buy liquid Motrin for children that is one dose. So you wouldn't just get one dose and then throw away the packaging. Rather, even the smallest bottle has multiple, multiple doses in it. And the thing is, Motrin you take every six hours. Again, Brett, you and I have a lot of experience with this. We go through a lot of Motrin and a lot of Tylenol with ear infections, and it's like clockwork. At five and a half hours, basically, I'm getting the Motrin out, prepared to give him his next dose so that the Motrin doesn't wear off. He gets very whiny, and then I have to wait another 30 minutes for the Motrin to kick in. I'm, I'm like standing right there waiting for the next dose so he can have some relief that's continued, which means I keep the Motrin actually out next to me at all times when we're in the midst of Motrin Tylenol regimen in an ear infection spout. Now, okay, so the gym says she comes at 1220. And here's the thing, she doesn't actually even work out. She leaves at 1242. Now, it might not seem as strange if she did show up at 1139, because then she would have been at the gym for an entire hour. But that's not what the gym has her clocking in at. And not only does she not work out there, she actually just spends time talking to people at the gym and showing pictures of Kyron with his science project from that morning. So I don't know what the purpose of going to the gym was, or maybe she had run out of time because she'd driven around for an hour and a half, but she drops off her daughter in order to be able to talk about Chiron to other people at the gym, but only for about 20 minutes. And there's several things about this that are unusual. Number one, she says she got there at 1139, but the gym has her clocking in 40 minutes later. What, what is the cause of that discrepancy? Why does that discrepancy exist? Why would she be saying that she got there earlier than she did? If she spent 40 minutes talking to people, that's also unusual. But remember, and Alice and I love talking about people going to the gym. This lady is not like us. This is what she does. And the more we talk about her, there will be more anecdotes about how much she goes to the gym. This is not the kind of person who goes to the gym for 20 minutes. This is the kind of person who goes to the gym and it's business and they get down to business. And for her, once again, to take her daughter who doesn't feel very well on this additional stop, not even really go to the gym, but just spend time talking to people, showing pictures of Chiron, which was a red flag for Desiree because according to her, at least Terry wasn't the kind of person to do that, but she's doing it that day. So on this day, you might say she's establishing an alibi. If one were a cynic, they might say that it's, it just so happens. This is the day where everybody sees her at the gym and they know she's there because she's, she's not at the machine working out or, you know, bench pressing. She's talking to people. She's being the social butterfly. And not only is she being a social butterfly, but she's showing how much she cares about her stepson. Oh, look at it. Look at him with this tree frog poster or whatever. I mean, that's what she's doing. And here's an interesting thing. It's not enough to just be seen in public to have an alibi. You need people to remember that you were there. And if you go somewhere where people know you, like your gym that you typically frequent, then we talked about this with Temujin Kensu, how he went to his dojo. He went to his dojo studio. He went to work out and that was part of his, like that, you know, people saw him and knew him there. Same here with this gym. She didn't just go to, because she's been in the public, remember? She's been at the Fred Meyer store at two of them. So you could pull up security footage and find her there. But here she is talking to people who know her, who know her name and will remember speaking with her and will remember seeing pictures of Kyron and also know something about Kyron that they could talk about him if asked by, say, the police later on. So it's a it's a good alibi to have to be talking to people you know. One other thing I want to know about young children who are sick. My kids eat like clockwork. <laughs> if noon comes around and lunch is not being served, they lose their minds. Now, maybe her daughter is sick and she doesn't want to eat, but this is right around the lunch hour, which most parents are on like a one, you know, beeline mission to get some type of food into their kids before they get hangry and melt down because kids are smaller. Their metabolisms work differently than adults. You and I can skip a meal, Brett, and we 
won't just fall into a puddle. But kids, their glucose levels, you know, can't regulate themselves like adults can. And so not only is it lunchtime hour, but she's actually, they're not at a restaurant. They're not eating. She's on, she's at the daycare, which is just another interesting thing. Like as a parent, I wouldn't have thought of this before I was a parent, but now I'm like 1220, 1242, man, that is like peak getting ready for nap, making sure everyone's fed so that we can have a good rest of the day, if, especially if you're sick. Whatever, Alice. I've seen you when you miss a meal. Uh, oh, it's terrible. I'm like a child, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> That's why I, I feel this so deeply. <laughs> okay, so she leaves at 1242, and at 1 o'clock, Terry arrives home. Now, remember, 1 o'clock was also the time of the talent show at the school. So this is the same time that the talent show begins. And it's sometimes stated that Kyron was supposed to be a part of the show, but we don't think that's actually true. And that would explain why his parents aren't at the talent show either and why no one noticed his absence. Because if he was just supposed to be sitting in the audience, talent shows, any show usually, the attention is all on who's on the stage and the rest of the auditorium typically is darkened. And so you may not miss someone who is or is not in the audience there. And this would make sense too, because Terry, you know, clearly was at the science fair that morning and she had the availability to be at the school at one o'clock if Kyron was in fact in the talent show. So I think it probably is true that he was not part of the talent show. Now at 1.21 p.m., Terry's back home, remember, she actually posts the picture of Kyron at the school fair to Facebook, the one that you guys have all seen now. She then emails Kyron's teacher to confirm when she can pick up his science project. Terry then emailed Desiree to let her know that she had posted the photo, as well as to ask her about some summer plans. Now this was unusual. Terry didn't usually email Desiree. If she had photos for her, she would put them in a flash drive that she sent with Kyron. Desiree was the one who was scheduled to pick up Kyron that evening for her weekend visit with him. And I think this is interesting too, because the thing about this, there's, there's a couple things that are interesting. That obviously is something people pick up on. Desiree was supposed to pick up Kyron that evening. There was no rush to do this. She could have given her the photos literally that day, but she's not doing that. She's emailing her. And there's something else I think is interesting about this, which just goes to something, you know, we've just been talking about our kids the whole time. We're going to keep doing that because 121, she got home around one. She is Johnny on the spot doing this stuff because think about what's happened this day. She's been driving around with a sick kid for a couple hours. She, as Alice said, kids probably hadn't been fed. It's going to be about nap time. And yet, in 20 minutes, she's already taken care of all the things she needed to take care of with her daughter and gotten on the computer and fired up Facebook and made sure she posted that picture and she's emailing people and emailing the picture. This is remarkable efficiency to me. When Alice and I are going to record, sometimes, you know, I'll say, well, let me, let me put the kids down. And 30 minutes later, maybe I'm ready, right? <laughs> like, it's just the fact that she was able to get home at one, take care of everything with her daughter and do this tells me this was really important to her that she get this done. And it's interesting because the things she gets done are, you know, like proof of Kyron and also two of her emails are talking about the future, the future of picking up a science project. Like does really, the last thing I want in my house is like yet another big poster board that my child has done. I love my child, but like, I'm not like rearing to have every single picture he draws at school come home with me because there's so many of them. And second, asking about something so far out as summer plans. You know, like, is this the time to do it? I, I mean, one o'clock when you have a sick child, maybe no one's eaten, including yourself. You're going to worry about that. Maybe. But like you said, it's, they're very, if you're trying to set up an alibi, this is, this is what you would do. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the voicemail message that Scott Peterson left on Lacey's phone when he was driving back from dumping her body. That's what it reminds me of. It really does. Where he's like, oh, you know, I, I couldn't get around to pick up the gift. I'll see you soon. I love you. Like all the things that you would expect one day, somebody's going to listen to that and be like, well, clearly he didn't kill her because he left this voicemail. And sure enough, there are people who do that. 
And it's just a smart thing to do, right? When you're setting up your hour. Because alibi. both Desiree and the teacher are like, well, he at this point in time at 121, Terry clearly doesn't suspect anything wrong because she's talking about him in the future tense. You know, what's going to happen this summer? When am I going to pick up your science project? That sort of thing. And also, it's interesting to be talking to Desiree because Desiree is going to figure it out very soon. And there's almost like a marker in the sand of, well, it couldn't be Terry. She was just talking to me about him when Desiree figures out that Kyron's not at school. And you see this so often in these cases, this it's being overly normal. It's being normal in a way that emphasizes just how normal you are being is what is what happens. And you see this in a lot of cases where people who are guilty will do things like this. A lot of times, if somebody hires a hitman, they're going to do this. I'm not saying there was a hitman in this case, but that's what people do. They're going to do things to just, you know, to make it seem like, man, what a normal day I was having. Everybody saw just how normal my day was. And there were people everywhere I went who will remember just how normal everything was. I mean, that's what they do because they're trying to set up this alibi and they want to make sure nobody misses it. You know, <laughs> like Alice said, it's important that they remember. And I feel like this is just, maybe it's innocent, but it feels so much like laying down a marker for the future of, well, obviously I didn't have anything to do with it because I just, I was planning for the future. Like Alice said, I was sending off photos. I was posting on Facebook. I couldn't have anything to do with this is what it feels like. It just has that feeling. So two hours later at 3.30, Terry and Kane, remember Kane is Kyron's dad. They go to meet the bus at the bus stop, which is something they often do. But bus stop happens, kids get off. Kyron's not one of them. He is not on the bus. They ask the bus driver what's going on. The bus driver says, never got on the bus. At this point, they call the school. That's when they realize that Kyron has been absent from school all day. Weird thing happens here. I think it's weird. Some people think it's weird. Maybe it's not. Terry asks the school to call 911. So they find out that the child's missing. She asks the school to call 911. She doesn't call 911. The, the mother and father don't call 911. They have the school do it. Maybe that was just convenient. I don't know. It's something that's always kind of struck me as a strange thing. But whatever the case, at 346, the school calls 911 and report Kyron missing. And this is one of those cases where the police bathe themselves in glory. It's kind of crazy how much effort the police put into this, given how little evidence is actually found. The police immediately respond. They're heading to Skyline in force. And Terry and Kane are going to Skyline as well by seven o'clock you have a formal missing person search the locals are calling in the fbi they're not hesitating they're not waiting to get as many people involved as this as they can and they are going to search all night with a lot of people by 11 p.m they have searched the school they have searched all the sort of outhouses around the school they have searched surrounding buildings that aren't even connected to the school. They have searched a train tunnel that's near the school. And they've searched Kyron's home because that's always a place you go because you never know with kids. They might have gone home. They might be hiding. You just don't know. So they have searched a lot of stuff already on this first day when Kyron's gone missing. But despite this, just remember, they're Johnny on the spot. But by this point, it's been 15 hours since the last time anyone saw Kyron. A lot of time has passed. And part of the reason a lot of time has passed is because everyone thought everything was fine, in part because of what Terry was doing. Right. Now, we go through the night. The next morning, June 5th at 5 a.m., hundreds of locals and professional searchers are looking for Kyron. This is really a community that's come together. It captures everyone's attention, this young seven-year-old boy missing out of thin air. Now, the search continues throughout the day. The police use scent dogs, though Desiree would later state that the police had trouble finding anything with Kyron's scent on it because Terry went on a laundry spree the night before washing all of his clothes. Also kind of convenient. Now, the FBI and the National Guard are both 
involved. We've talked about this before where smaller jurisdictions or really any state and local law enforcement can call on the FBI or National Guard to help if it's just something that requires a lot of effort and they want to you know, double, double, triple their, their manpower to search because time is of the essence. We've talked about this. Every hour that passes with a missing person, especially a missing child, the risks heighten and the probability of finding them alive diminishes quickly. I just find this really interesting, the, the clothing, the scent thing. Even if I did a lot of laundry, which I don't do, <laughs> even if I did a lot of laundry, there'd still be a lot of things in my house with my kids' scent on it. Their bed sheets, their blankets, their favorite stuffies, they're, you know, they're just, they're all over my house all the time. And my laundry machines are not big enough for me to wash everything that has their scent on it in one night. And let me just say this, Desiree does not like Terry. <laughs> and she's got lots of reasons not to like her. I mean, given the fact that her husband was having an affair with her, while she was pregnant and in fact invited her to the hospital when the baby was born so that she could meet, you know, what was going to be her stepson. Just not cool, right? <laughs> Just doesn't like her and is pretty convinced that she had something to do with Kyron's disappearance. So most of the things you will read and see are very much from Desiree's perspective. Desiree owns the narrative on this case. There's not a lot of information out there, not a lot of information coming from the police. And as we've said before, when you have an information vacuum, something will fill that up. And in this case, it's been Desiree and her statements and her recollection of everything that happened. But having said that, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt, given her perspective. She says that this is what Terry was doing. I'm sure Terry would probably tell you this is how I deal with stress and I didn't even think about it. And so I was just cleaning and I was washing and I was hoping we'd hear something. Whatever the case is, according to Desiree, this is what happened. I don't know. It's a weird thing. It is a little bit weird. And remember, you're right. You have to take things with a grain of salt coming from Desiree. But like... Desiree also has a reason to suspect Terry. This is a woman who like hoodwinked her when she was in kidney failure and kept her child for the next six years, you know? So th there's a lot of history there to keep in mind as we go through this. Now on June 6th, the FBI create a profile of Kyron and along with 50 detectives, that's a lot of detectives y'all, that's like everyone on the force, begins interviewing 300 students and their parents. Kyron's relatives are distributing flyers, and the flyers read three feet, eight inches tall, 50 pounds, blue eyes, brown hair, last seen wearing black cargo pants, white socks, and worn black Skecher tennis shoes with orange trim. The same description that you see in the picture from the science fair the last morning he was seen. And you can see he's just a little kid. I mean, he's like three and a half feet tall, 50 pounds. And by the way, this is kind of terrifying. I think that's how big my two-year-old is. <laughs> I have a monster of a child. Yeah, um, he was he was a little kid. I he mean, was he was a little kid. Yeah. And generally described as you know super sweet. Uh, just, I mean, he's a kid, right? And the thing about this is, we've reached the end of our timeline because literally nothing happens after this. This is crazy, by the way, that nothing happens because they jumped on it so quickly. There's no, there's nothing else. Yeah, I mean, we can't, we can't, you know, a lot of times we'll skip ahead six months when they found something. They didn't find anything ever. They didn't find anything. And they worked this case to death to the point that at Multnomah County board meetings, the cost of this became an issue because the county was spending so much money every month on the search for month on end, trying to find something. I mean, they were absolutely committed to this. You could not have had a more committed group of people trying to find this child. And they just found nothing. I mean, nothing, not a scrap of clothing, not a footprint, not a confirmed sighting. I mean, people of course would call in and say, I saw a kid down at the corner kind of looked like him, but those aren't real sightings. Not a single thing ever came out of this search that we know of. Now, once again, maybe they have some information they've never released, but as far as anybody knows, this was a complete dead end and it just didn't matter how many days and how many weeks and how many months they put into this. This became a huge story in Portland. This was not a story that was underreported. Everybody in Oregon knew about this. 
was a big story. It was a pretty big story nationally, but it was a really big story in Oregon. So people were looking, they were looking for him and there was just nothing. And it just feels like he just literally vanished into thin air with no trace to the point that it's just, it's, it's really hard to believe it's even possible. It's really hard to believe because remember, it's not that they were out camping in the middle of nowhere and they woke up and he was gone and he wandered off and they never found a trace of him. He's in the middle of a school and there are tons of people at school, more people than normal, which on the one hand, both makes it potentially more dangerous, but also means there should have been a lot more witnesses who saw something. And yet you don't see that. We're going to talk about this case a lot more. We got a lot more to talk about. This is just like, oh, my brain is like hurting because I'm trying to make sense of all of it. And I cannot believe there's not more information. There's not a whole lot more information. Now, there are other things we're going to talk about, which are interesting. And there's a lot about Terry. I will say this. If Terry is a red herring, if she had nothing to do with this, then we literally have nothing. (laughs) We have Nada. Most of what we're going to talk about are things that lead people to think that Terry may have been involved in this. And you can judge for yourself whether or not this is real or not. Big divide in the true crime community. There's a lot of people who really feel like this has become a witch hunt. That Terry is an innocent person who, who because there's no information, people just latched onto and really made her life a living hell. To the point that at one point she tried to change her name. But the people who who really don't like her showed up to the court hearing and protested it. And the judge wouldn't let her change her name. So it's just her life has been ruined by this. Whether she did this or not, she she has continued to live under this really dark cloud. We're going to talk about the facts. We're going to talk about some of the things that lead you both ways. And maybe, hopefully, there's somebody out there who does know something. It would be nice to provide some sort of closure to this family. Like I said, we got a lot more to talk about on this. We got several more episodes we're going to do on this. If you have thoughts, shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Check us out on Twitter at prosecutorspod and all your social media. Hello to those of you on YouTube. I hope those of you on Patreon are enjoying this episode early and ad free. You guys are the best and we love you. Let us know what you think. Leave a review. Tell a friend. Give us five stars. Whatever you want to do to help. I prefer telling a friend. Telling a friend is always the best thing you can do. But you guys, you guys do you. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? Um, I'm so excited to really dive into this. You know, we spent a lot of time on the timeline because we wanted to make sure you guys knew where everything was, especially because there's so little information in this case. But you just wait. It gets weirder when we really dive into all the different factors within this case. So we look forward to doing that next time. Yes, we do. But... Until next time, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Let's get to... Anyways, I think we probably yeah okay and multnoma 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 okay the dog's barking downstairs it's okay he just wants to be part of the podcast there you go here we go oh i gotta get a word for you i know it's a lot man i I can't just whip them out like you do i gotta get them uh gotta go to my list okay now that's enough
you may not be able to file extensions like you want. Exactly. I can't even file extensions for myself. What are you doing? Whatever. Don't don't even. I don't know. That's kind of. I'm just just greatness all around me. You know, it's just. If I have seen more than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. That's actually a great point, though. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couples retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV 